You ever read a book, watch a movie, learn some history, and think to yourself, that was pretty good, but what if it turned out this way instead? Me too! I like speculative history as much as the next person, but the world is a complicated place. The more accurate you try to be, the more vague your alternate history must become. It's too bad we'll never know for sure how things might have played out. Or will we? If there's one thing people like to say about history, it's that it repeats. Today I'm going to tell you a story about how a young noblewoman used her position as the Emperor's wife to take control of the Roman Empire only to find herself locked in a life and death struggle with her own teenage son. One story repeated across centuries with two very different endings. Speaking of a shared story with different endings, this is the story of two-thirds of men by the time they're 35, a beautiful, bountiful hairline waving goodbye in the mirror. For some men it ends here, some here, and some here. That's why Keeps is sponsoring today's episode. They want a new ending where you take your hair into your own hands. Keeps is a hair loss prevention medication used by hundreds of thousands of men that delivers affordable, FDA-approved hair loss treatments to your door. Treatments offered by Keeps are 90% effective at treating hair loss and can increase hair growth by up to 35%. Now they offer shampoo and conditioner to keep your hair thick and healthy. Don't wait, get your special offer at keeps.com slash Jack Rackham. AD 15. Julia Agrippina was the descendant of a god. The great-granddaughter of the divine Emperor Augustus, her family was monumental and all-powerful. Her father was a war hero who restored the Empire's military honor in Germania and was heir to the Empire. And then political shenanigans happened, Agrippina's entire family got killed, and the Empire went to her mentally unstable brother Caligula. Yay! It was her against the world. She tried to kill Caligula, failed, got exiled, but eventually Caligula died, her uncle Claudius lifted that exile, and eventually Agrippina married the new emperor. It was an odd pairing because that new emperor was her uncle Claudius. AD 750. The Western Roman Empire is a memory four lifetimes old. The palace Agrippina called home, her summer villa by the coast, both lie in ruins. Dynasties have come and gone, Christianity has taken hold of a continent, and Rome's old enemy, the Persians, have been supplanted by the Caliphate. In this time was born Irene of Athens, daughter of a Greek noble family. Like Agrippina, she found herself in bed with the emperor, a man named Oh, what was it again? There's only, like, five Byzantine names. Let's see if I can remember. A man named... Leo the Fourth. That's it. This marriage was an odd pairing because the hot-button issue of the day was religious iconography. Leo's father was a fierce iconoclast. Religious art dominated the Middle Ages in Europe, but... Like much of the Muslim world, Leo's father saw it as idolatrous and wanted to purge it. Leo continued those policies. Irene and her family were of the opposite persuasion, that religious iconography was to be celebrated, that you're worshipping God, not the art. Irene's relationship with her husband was strained, the traditional story goes, when Leo discovered beneath her pillow a religious icon she'd kept in secret. Leo refused to sleep with her again, but wouldn't exile her. She was, after all, the mother of his only son. She was given a second chance, and Irene does not make the same mistake twice. Agrippina's marriage was similarly rocky. Part of her uncle's decision to marry her was rooted in the fact that her only son was one of the last male members of the imperial dynasty. Claudius wanted to keep her close so that the ambitious Agrippina couldn't rally support to dethrone Claudius in favor of her son. In fact, he even seemed to appease her by naming her son as his heir after they were wed, skipping over his own son Britannicus. But just as Britannicus was beginning to come of age, Claudius appeared to be having second thoughts. Perhaps that's why Agrippina killed him. 
It's entirely possible he died of natural causes. He had ongoing health issues at 63 years old. Ancient sources speculate that his demise was Agrippina's doing, but the job of a Roman historian is to tell a good story first and get their facts straight second. Irene's husband did die of natural causes, as far as we know, and her nine-year-old son named... Oh, hold on. Constantine VI took the throne. Irene had to deal with her plots and chaos afterwards. While her son was a boy, complete authority over the empire fell to her. The last woman to wield this much power was the Empress Martina, a century or so before Irene. She had been accused of murdering her husband and was turned on by all of her closest allies. Her tongue was cut out, her sons castrated, and all of them sent into exile. To avoid this, Irene potentially spread rumors to slander her dead husband, which, in light of the Martina story and not wanting to be seen as having a reason to murder your husband sounds a little counterproductive, but Leo wasn't really that beloved. So this was Irene's ticket to immediately position herself as righteous and popular by telling everyone Leo touched something he shouldn't have and she was gonna put it back. But that wasn't enough for everybody. A conspiracy arose to put Leo's half-brother on the throne, but Irene was quick to catch it out. The men responsible were beaten, tonsured, and banished. It was her or them. With the possible threats to her rule subdued, but still very much alive, Irene pulled on an ace up her sleeve to win support, and win back her religious freedom, and extend that same freedom to her people. Banning religious art? Not that popular. but. Irene couldn't so easily wave her hand and backpedal on decades of state-enforced religious practice, because a lot of people in government were there in the first place because they supported Leo's artistic timeout time. But when the Patriarch of Constantinople announced his retirement, and expressed a deep regret for all his years of enforcing iconoclasm, Irene saw her chance. And that's why she started preparing for a fake war against the Abbasid Caliphate. That seems completely unrelated, but Irene was actually thinking like 10 steps ahead. You see, in order to repeal iconoclasm, Irene needed to appoint a new patriarch. In order to approve a new patriarch, she needed to assemble a council of delegates from all over the Christian world. Many of those delegates were appointed by her iconoclast predecessors, and those iconoclast delegates incited the soldiers in the city to storm the church and interrupt the official process. Irene had to say, Ah, you got me, you got me, I'm calling it off. But you can't fool Irene twice. Suddenly, not much later, she raises the alarm and sends all of those same troops out to the edge of the empire to defend against an Arab invasion. Except there was no invasion. Instead of meeting the Arabs, those soldiers were surrounded by the rest of the Byzantine army, forced to hand over their weapons and go home. Meanwhile, Irene had replaced them all with new soldiers loyal to her, called the bishops back to promote her chosen patriarch, and ended the iconoclasm. This was very popular, as evidenced by the iconoclastic Emperor Constantine V, i.e. Leo's dad, being called Constantine anointed in urine. In some Christian traditions, Irene became a saint after her death. She restored religious freedom and mended a religious schism with the West, bringing her closer to the Pope and Charlemagne. So just let that one percolate for a bit. Irene had won the power to rule, but seemingly just as she had done so, her son, now 17, was of age to rule in his own right. Irene had no intention of stepping down. Anywhere the Emperor was pictured, so too was the Emperor's mother Irene. Her name came first in the Oath of Allegiance, she was the one holding the symbol of authority, and her name alone was on the head side of every coin. Her son was completely excluded from government, and he was not happy about it. Seven centuries before, the Emperor's mother was on every coin, and her 17-year-old son was not happy about it. When the young emperor held court, in the room behind a thick curtain was Agrippina, positioned to discreetly listen to everything and later instruct her son on how to proceed. 
That is, until one day when her son was meeting with an ambassador, and Agrippina did not like what she was hearing. She emerged from her room and began to rise up the stairs to the throne to speak to the ambassador on equal footing with the emperor until he got up from his seat to cut her off halfway and dismiss her. He was having affairs, he was listening to poor counsel and former slaves, he was refusing her advice, Agrippina was losing her authority over her son and her hold over the empire. Agrippina suddenly began making a lot of racket about Britannicus, how he was the one true son and heir to Claudius, and doesn't he deserve to be the emperor if you really think about it? Unfortunately for Agrippina, her son had learned a lot from her. Britannicus died an agonizing death choking on poisoned wine, and Agrippina recognized her son had become every bit as ruthless as she. In short time, Agrippina's allies were removed from court, and she herself was sent to live in a new residence. Unfortunately, the trouble didn't end there, because her son was Nero. And one day, he decided to take her life. He takes her out on a boat ride in feigned reconciliation. The ceiling collapses and the boat sinks. Agrippina sees one of her servants pretending to be her in order to be rescued, except you don't look like Agrippina. No! It's me! You gotta believe me! Let me up! Mm. Oh gods, 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 oh gods. Agrippina swims to shore, takes refuge in a nearby villa. A crowd of people have gathered to see what's going on. If the Emperor's mother is in trouble, they are dispersed by a column of armed men who march into the villa and finish the job. Roman historian Cassius Dio claimed she asked to be stabbed in the womb, a final spite against the cruel monster that came crawling out of it. You see what I mean? These guys are artists. Nero went on to become increasingly paranoid, killing his most trusted generals and advisors. Then when rebellion came, he took his own life in fear, even though the rebels actually wanted to negotiate. Whoops. But, you ask, what if things had ended differently? Skipping forward over the pages of history, we set the story back to the crucial moment where the Empress Mother has taken power, and her son is approaching his rebellious phase. Young Constantine is frustrated. He's been forced into one marriage, then that was broken and he was forced into a new one, and there were rumors, at least among Byzantine historians, if not circling the court, that Irene was listening to wicked prophecy about the Empire belonging to her. So Constantine schemes, not against his mother at first, but against her highest minister, hoping to get him out of the picture and take his place. But the plot is exposed and his allies arrested. They were sent off to have horrible things done to them, but the way Irene treated Constantine was just humiliating. She punished his attempted coup by striking him, scolding him, and sending him to his room for several days. This, it would seem, was not received well. Half of the Empire's army rejected Irene as their leader. Unlike Agrippina, sometimes credited with the best years of Nero's reign, Irene's rule had been a bit of a mixed bag. Getting rid of iconoclasm won her popular support, but the men in power objected to her replacing so many key positions, and her use of eunuchs, and her military failures. And also, they kinda had this image of Constantine in their head as a man who would be great at leading the army because man? Or at the very least, they hoped he would be a man who would pursue the priorities of his grandfather. You know, the one who was baptized in urine. So the army rose up and demanded Irene release Constantine from his timeout in order to lead them. She did so, and Constantine was named Sole Emperor. Irene was locked away in the palace. But Constantine VI was not Nero. He was actually willing to make amends. And he was not a very good leader, probably because no one ever taught him, but he was wise enough to recognize that he was not a very good leader. And so, he brought his mother back as his co-ruler two years later, with the idea that this time they would be true equals. This turned out to be a mistake, because you can't beat Irene twice. From Constantine VI's perspective, his mother saved his skin. Six months after she came back to power, Constantine suffered a humiliating defeat in battle, and the army attempted to place one of his uncles on the throne. But, perhaps with his mother's help, he was able to come out on top. But what to do with that rebel uncle? It's sad. 
but there's only one thing you can do. Take from him his eyes, and he will be unable to rule. Ugh, are you sure? It's either him or you. And it is a mercy that he should live at all. Then let it be done. And while I've got you, I was thinking we could do something about your other uncles. Maybe rip out their tongues just to be safe. Very well. Heaven forgive me. And your general, too, just to really cover all our bases. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. This was the same general who put Constantine on the throne in the first place. You can imagine Irene's satisfaction. The message received by all of Constantine's supporters in the army was clear. Loyalty to the Emperor got you nowhere. And with no one to back him up, Irene springs the trap. Constantine is on campaign with his mother's closest advisors when they seize him and drag him back to the palace, perhaps to the very room where he was born. If so, the rich purple stone of those walls was the first thing he ever saw, and the last. That is so edgy. That's what it might have looked like if we'd ever gotten Emperor Agrippina, and I am here for it. Of course, blinding and probably killing her son created a whole new barrel of problems for Irene. Yes, it was seen with shock and disgust, but more pressingly, no son meant no heir. She had surrounded herself with eunuchs to try to eliminate the number of men trying to start their own dynasty, but one of these eunuchs has a brother, and another one... I mean, screw it, he would really like to be emperor before he dies, and the royal court became an absolute mess of squabbling. The empire was in a sorry state, still not militarily successful, treasury being drained by tribute payments to the caliphate, turmoil in court, but none of that was going to matter. Irene had a plan so ambitious that, had it succeeded, it would be the only thing people remembered her for. A way to make the empire richer, larger, stronger, and solve the air crisis. Marry Charlemagne. Combine the East and the West, create a new Roman Empire that could rival the Abbasid Caliphate, and better yet, the proposal had come from Charlemagne in the first place. All she had to do was say yes. Charlemagne's ambassadors arrived in Constantinople ready to make a deal, only to watch all of those ambitions go up in smoke in a single day. Hello, we're here from His Majesty Charlemagne. We have an appointment at three. Ah, uh, yes, let's see. I think I've got you in here. It's terrible! You've got to let me in! The eunuch is about to seize power! Oh no! And the only way to stop him is to make me emperor instead. Then there's no time to lose. Andale! This random dude, a finance minister, just waltzes in, takes the throne for himself, and breaks apart the biggest power couple of all time. He came to Irene in a humble outfit, telling her he didn't want to become emperor, that he was forced into it but he still needed her to resign all of her power and hand over every last penny of her treasure. But Irene was spared the fate of Nero or her son Constantine. Instead of being blinded, she was sent off to the island of Lesbos. And you can't give Irene mercy because she will evolve, improve, and come back for revenge. Except this time. This time she died a year later. 